I will come to you. I am the Moon Jin King. Superman the movie. I am going to review for you. However, I have to tell you, I have been waiting a long time to finally get into this. Reviewing movies. This is what I've been wanting to do from the beginning. <laughs> and it's taken me all this time. I only did one. Kong Skull Island on the Moon Chin King channel. Go and check it out if you have not witnessed it. That had a lot of editing with inserting images and things like that. I won't do that this time. I'll just have this, this lovely image here. The poster. Um... I think this is a good place to start because this was one of the first Superman movies. No, no, it was the first Superman. Well, before this movie, they only had uh, serials, like shorts. This was the first theatrical full length film as we know today. And one of the first superhero movies ever. Um, before this, there was, let me just look. Uh, the Mark of Zorro was 1920, and there were sequels, Son of Zorro, um, Mark of Zorro, 1940, and there was the Lone Ranger films, The Sign of Zorro, Zorro the Avenger. But as far as I know, he was not really a superhero. I've seen a couple of Zorro films, he just seems like a guy with a sword. I don't think he actually has powers. Um, however, in 1977, there was a movie called Abba, the first black Superman. <laughs> so, ironically, it came out before uh, the first white Superman, which was 1978 this movie came out. So, um, it beat you to it indeed. That wasn't by DC, that was by Walt Disney no, 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 it wasn't. That was by Mira releasing. I don't know if they're indie or what. In terms of Marvel... Well, no, actually. Um, there was Superman and the Mole Men, 1951. That was what I was... Uh, that was a television series. Um, and this was a pilot for the series, Adventures of Superman. And there was a government produced stamp day for Superman in 1954, an 18 minute short film. Um, and of course there was Batman 1966, I would get to that on my Batman Mondays, I think. I would try and do a Batman movie review every Monday, Superman every Wednesday, a Friday, I, I forgot what I have in store on Fridays. Do I have it written down? Um, I cannot witness it. I cannot witness it! I don't know where it's gone. Uh, it's either Fantastic Four, um, or something like that. And then I will get to the X-Men movie soon, also. Um, I will, uh, figure, don't, uh, hold me to my word. I am, uh, will probably break my promise anyway. However, where are we? So, in Marvel, Marvel, Captain America was 1944, um, but that was, again, a serial film, 15 chapter. The first Marvel full-length film was uh, Howard the Duck in 1986. So, really, this movie, uh, Superman the movie, is really the first full-length superhero film that's not Zorro. Zoro I'm not counting unless I'm missing something because he's a vigilante for sure but not he's more like Batman I would say but Batman as we know is you know pretty inhuman I mean he should be dead for sure um, so it's a bloodline but certainly in terms of DC and Marvel this is the first so how was it <coughs> it's actually been a few days since I watched it now and I actually watched it in two parts because it was quite late so I watched half 
and then the next day I watch the other half. So not ideal, but um, I also I I just wanted to get this review out there and not waste any more time. So that's why I have to do it, no matter. I've been talking for about five minutes now without anything happening. I haven't even gotten to it yet. And that's how this movie starts. This movie starts. Five minutes of credits at the beginning. <laughs> five minutes and it go feels like forever. So I do understand your, your pain. Uh, great opening titles, but... It gets very repetitious. It has blue neon names over and over and over for five slow, slow minutes. It was cool for like the first minute, but then, no. The music is great, of course. And uh, it's in space and it looks very cool and bright and it comes at you. It was really a great uh, opening th when it first hits you, but it drones on forever. Like I will be doing for sure. Um, and it shows us this icy looking place. And uh, it actually turned out to be Krypton. But uh, I thought at first it was the Antarctica or something. Because I I have seen this film before. Not I don't think I ever saw it beginning to end. But I'm aware of Superman and... You know, the uh, Fortress of Solitude that he has in the Arctic. But we'll get to that. Um, what is this movie about? Okay, a brief summary. This guy, this guy is from a planet Krypton. And he, his home planet Krypton gets destroyed. But before it gets destroyed, his parents put him on this shiny thing that looks ridiculous but it's kind of cool also and sends him off across space to escape the uh, destruction of his people and he lands on earth and he is adopted by old people very old people the woman can't have a child i think uh, i think it was implied or maybe said outright that they uh, tried having children but it, they were unsuccessful. And now the woman saw it as a gift from the Lord. Giving this uh, baby. Because they were just driving by. And then crash. The baby crashes in, into uh, a field. Of course with the protective casing. But and in fact he wasn't a baby. He was like uh, a young boy at this point. That is one thing I didn't understand, how much time actually passed whilst he was transported. Because he was a baby when they put him in, but when he reached there he looked about four or five. And there were about three different time durations that were mentioned in the film. Um, I think his father said something, he recorded his voice. His father said something. Lex Luthor said something later on, how long uh, he it would have taken to reach here. And then someone else said another uh, duration, and I was very confused how old, how long ago Krypton was destroyed, and how long he was on that ship, that uh, transport. But anyway, he gets adopted, and uh, it skips through his childhood, we don't see that. Um, we see a bit when he's uh, in high school, but he looks pretty still quite uh, an old high schooler at that point. Uh, nothing really to see there. Um, eventually, he leaves the farm. I think it's a farm. I'm not. They live in a rural area surrounded by fields, and then he goes and uh, works in a in a journalist. Um, a newspaper place, a reporter, that's what I mean, for some reason. And that's it, he has, oh yes, he has a, the obvious thing, is that he has powers. For some reason, his father knew that once he got to Earth, he would have these powers. He would not be like anyone else. I don't know how he knows this. I don't know if he specifies in, I don't know if he's a scientist. 
I don't know who these people are, really. Who his father was, who his mother was. What place his people have in in the universe? Uh, we only ever they look humanoid. We don't see any other alien species. They live in a very strange, icy looking place. It's clearly miniature. You know, it's a charming miniature in the film. But I don't really get a... We don't get a good look at their culture. We don't really see that many people, even. Uh, houses, I don't really know what they look like. It's just very sort of plain, sort of weird. I don't know how to explain. Like the Arctic. Uh, everything's just sort of white. Um, so we don't really know much about his people. But his father seemed to be on some council. That, you know, a typical council weren't listening to him. He, w he knew that the world was going to end in a few days. Because of the sun uh, radiation or exploding or whatever it was. It was going to destroy the planet and they were not listening. They were like, don't cause hysteria. Ah. They didn't care one bit. And he was saying, we need to evacuate. No one was listening. And they were threatening him, saying, you better not speak or whatever. And you better not leave. So again, uh, I didn't really understand what their purpose was, what their deal was. Are they corrupt? Did they know the world was going to end and they just weren't bothered? Did they have some secret plan? Were they sacrificing themselves? What was their business? Why were they not paying attention to his warnings? I don't know. Um, and why did he not just go against what they said anyway? He could have told everyone regardless. I mean, your entire planet is about to be destroyed and you're just not going to say anything because of what because some old people threatened you very mildly everyone on that planet died and Carl L is that his name his dad didn't bother to warn anyone as far as we can tell they didn't even save themselves they the only survivor is this guy it would seem Although we know that's not the case because I've seen the second movie. I believe it's the second movie where there are other survivors. And we see them at the beginning of this movie. Uh, Kal-El, Superman's dad, real dad. Was sort of sentencing them. Um, judging them. They were criminals trying to take over or something. General Zod and a woman and a, a big guy. Um, we know that they survived because I've seen the second film and I learned I was confused I was really confused because I knew they weren't in the first movie I was pretty sure and then I see them right at the beginning of this movie and I thought what's going on but I found out afterwards that this one and the second movie were actually shot sort of back to back I believe or most of the second one. Um, they were shot sort of together. Um, but it didn't really... It was out of place because we see these guys being sentenced. And there's a very cheesy effect like a m flying mirror. Flying and then they get trapped in this glass thing that's flying around. It looks very, very cheesy and dated but it's charming too but the point i'm making is it doesn't fit into anything else in the film because we never see them again in this film um but yes so he's a a guy whose family whose planet's destroyed and he's sent to earth and uh he's the odd one out and he has these powers what does he do? Well, you know, he's a good guy. He's a super guy. Um, yes. It was, you know, the effects were dated. They were cheesy. Uh, at the beginning, you know, Krypton I mentioned. But even when they were inside, you could tell they put a lot of effort into it. 
you know, you can appreciate the effort that must have gone into it. I did read that uh, some of the sets came from the original Star Wars film. They reused things. That was 1977. This is 98. 78. Um, so that makes sense. Uh, um, but, you know, I didn't feel like anything looked like Star Wars. You know, Star Wars seems to have aged much better. Even the original. I'm not talking about special editions, but... This was more like a fantasy sort of feeling on Krypton. You know, white, glowy, sort of, uh, like, um, like a fantasy setting. Um, like a surrealism. But, you know, nothing really made me laugh out, out, laugh out loud in this film in terms of effect, except when I see the baby Superman being carried in with from his mother. His, his mother is carrying the baby and he's wrapped in this brightly coloured, it looks like a tin foil or something, just, when, just before they're about to uh, send him off into space. And you know, moments like that look very uh, um, cheesy. It's just bright uh, coloured foil, it looks like he's wrapped in. But, uh, but you know, it's a unique look. Um, they tried, you can tell. And uh, I don't hold it against them, of course. It, it gives it, it certainly feels like it's out of uh, this world. Um, but, you know, again, I, I do think we should have had a little more insight into his people at the beginning. Everything seemed sort of rushed um, but you know we didn't really get a, a sense of community uh, all we really saw was these gr this room of old people this council and when when Krypton actually gets destroyed we just see loads of people falling over into and the earth getting not the earth but the earth of Krypton getting you know, ripped apart and people falling over. We don't actually actually see, get a sense where they are, where the surroundings are. We just see people falling into pits uh, out of nowhere. But, uh, yes, it was odd no one believed him and didn't understand that. Is there some conspiracy? Why aren't they allowed to leave the planet, I wonder? Um... It seemed like he put something, the kryptonite, in the transport with him. And I wasn't sure, you know, how was he able to hold it? It was a crystal, but I'm not certain if it was kryptonite. Um, he puts it with the baby in the transport. It wasn't green at that point, I don't think. I think it was clear. But later on, we see that it's green. And uh, I don't, I don't understand the kryptonite being poisonous aspect of it. Um, I don't know, but his father was very sort of didn't very really fight very hard. He didn't didn't let anyone know, didn't warn anybody as far as we're concerned. How long was the journey? Did the baby need to eat? I mean, it was definitely a number of years for sure, and it doesn't seem like he ate anything. Do they not need to eat uh, in space? He has superpowers on Earth, but does he have superpowers flying from Krypton to Earth? I, I don't know. Um, we know he can still fly in space when he's grown up. Um, oh yes, when he lands, uh, they find out pretty quickly that he has powers because he lifts up the truck. Uh, when it falls, I don't know, the the old man was doing something, uh, his adoptive father with the truck, and then it goes wrong, and then the boy picks up the truck, and I'm not sure how, obviously they did that to show us that the uh, parents found out his powers, but I don't know why the boy knew that he could pick up the truck at that point, uh, seemed kind of, I don't know out of place, as soon as he gets out of that, that shipwreck. Um, 
there's a big time skip after this. We see, uh, you know, some reckless train running. Um, you know, he has to keep this a secret. Um, we see that uh, he doesn't really want to, but he does. But he has to keep it a secret. And uh, he gets inspiring words from his father, uh, his adopted father. I re really enjoyed him. He wasn't in it for very long, unfortunately. But, you know, I, I was thinking uh, he wasn't very careful. You know, he was kicking the uh, football like miles up into the air. But then I was thinking also, well, he could probably hear if people are around. So maybe it makes sense. Maybe uh, he knew no one was watching. But uh, also running along side by side by the train where anyone can see him. In fact, a little girl did see him. She was apparently Lois Lane, who we see later on. But, I don't know, she looked very tiny and he was a lot older, for sure. And yet, later on when we see Lois, she looks like an old woman. So, she's definitely meant to be younger than him, but she looks older, for sure. Um, yes, I was disappointed about the father dying. Like straight away pretty much he i really liked his uh performance i heard that he was actually the original superman from a serial or something um do correct me i think that's what i read and i apparently the adoptive mum was someone from the original also like lois possibly um so yes he was uh you know he was the uh the supportive uh, old man. He gave a good speech. Um, you know, caring, warming, kind. But then uh, Superman kills him basically because he uh, challenges him for a race, and then <laughs> and then uh, the father has a heart attack and dies. And then it's the funeral. And. Uh, he says, all of those powers, and I couldn't save him. And that was the end of the funeral. Um, I thought that went very abruptly, to be honest. Uh, the pacing was, I think, too fast at that point. You know, it would have been good to see... You know, he says the, he says the line, all those powers, and I couldn't save him. And yet, we never actually see him try to save him. You know, the shot is just that... He collapses, Aunt May, not Aunt May, that's spite, I don't know what she's called. The aunt, not the aunt, the mother. She's so old, she looks like Aunt May. Uh, they see that he's collapsed and then he just runs to him. And then it's a pretty far away shot. So we don't really see that emotion. It would have been good, compelling to actually see him use his powers. Desperately using his powers to try and save uh his uh that old man that father but we don't see that it just skips straight to the funeral and him saying all those powers and i couldn't save him show us trying to save him um so it happened very quickly and then uh, he randomly one night gets drawn to the farmhouse stable Something just wakes him up and makes him go to the stable. And there he finds the kryptonite buried. I think it's kryptonite. It sure is, looks like the same uh, shape as... Well, actually, later on it looks like a rock. But in later films, like uh, Superman uh, Returns, is that the one? It looks like this. How it looks like a long crystal. It looks the same. So I don't know why he's able to hold it now. If it even is the same thing. Is it just not toxic then or what? Um, and then he has to leave because... Um, I don't know. He says he has to leave. And then his uh, fake mom says... Uh, she knew this time would come. She knew this time would come. But, 
what we have to realize is she is a very old woman and he is a young man. Of course this time would come. I, regardless of whether he was an alien or not, I mean, you can expect this guy to want to leave this uh, field at some point and uh, join the real world. So he leaves. Um, I do wonder how he knew what to do with the kryptonite, to be honest. And why did he go to the Arctic? Um, in particular, is it, well, you know, I know it's deserted, but he specifically went to the Arctic and he threw the kryptonite uh, and it did something in the water and a massive construction structure appears, uh, which looks like it's made out of ice. So I don't know what kind of magic that was, but it uh, sure glad that that worked for you. Um, oh yes, uh, that. So the father, his voice, he has like a a face that appears in this icy construction that was formed, and he says that by the time he sees this. He would have been dead for thousands of years. And that's really odd because later on, you know, Lex said something completely different, it seems. He said something like 10 years or 3 years, I, I don't remember. Um, so I, I'm just confused about the time, really. Um, and it's, he said it's forbidden to interfere with human history. And I, I don't know who made those rules, honestly. Why? How does his dad know so, know so much about Earth and humans? Um, and then at the end of this speech, we see um, he's just randomly in his costume. He's just standing there in his costume. And uh, we don't know where it came from. We don't know if he made it himself. We know nothing. But it should be said that I actually... I, uh, I watched the theatrical version. Uh, I think 2 hour 20 minute version. I didn't watch the... Uh, director's extended uh, three-hour cut and I'm sure it would, was probably explained in there but in this version it was certainly jarring to just see him stood there in a costume that came out of nowhere as far as I'm concerned in the middle of the Arctic. Um, how did he end up in Metropolis? This is the city he goes to to work. Um, how did he choose this place to go? Did he go to university? Um, is he acting awkward on purpose? And, you know, his acting is the highlight of this film, I would say. Yes, he is acting uh, on purpose as this fumbling guy who doesn't know what he's doing, who's naive and innocent. But that is his disguise, you know. He is just trying to be less than ordinary, for sure. Um, but he does things that don't make sense, such as he's trying to be secretive, and yet there's this scene where him and Lois get uh, um, threatened in an alleyway by a mugger. And uh, they, go, they have a little scuffle, and then when he leaves, he says something about his, every specific thing that's in her purse. And she's like, how do you know exactly what's in my purse? And uh, he just gave himself away for no reason. Why? I mean, he's not actually dumb. So why is he giving himself away like this? You know, doesn't make sense because he, oh yes, he can see through things. He has x-ray vision, even though we don't see the x-ray power. But we know that he can see through objects and uh, yes it doesn't really make sense because he's meant to be in disguise and he's just saying oh I know exactly what's in your purse 
the exact contents of it without looking. Unless he's trying to be a magician, which he's not, he's a reporter, so I don't understand. Um, then we get introduced to this fumbling idiot <laughs> who the police are following on a train station. And yes, one of them continues to pursue whilst the other one calls for backup and walks away. Of course I wondered, why can't he call for backup while walking with his partner? But no, apparently he has to walk off to call for backup whilst the one guy follows him alone. The, uh, the guy, the idiot henchman, he's like against the wall of the subway. Uh, you know, the trains go by and he's against the wall. The policeman saw exactly where he was standing. He could have talked into his walkie-talkie to uh, report what he was seeing, but no, he didn't. He did not, um, because he was against the wall because there was a secret door in that position that turns around, I believe. So he knew where the door was. Instead of reporting it straight away, he just decides to follow. And. Uh, Yes, that did not go well because Lex Luthor, the evil guy in this, he was looking through his camera and he saw him and he pressed a button and the door, psh, you know, it went out onto the tracks and uh, he died. And that, that, that henchman got a little bit of, he always gets told off by Lex for being an idiot and yet he still employs him for some reason. I'm assuming he's paying him money, but I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he was not. But he, uh, scolds him for being followed again. I mean, so, how, I, I do wonder how many times he was being followed. Uh, because this would suggest that the last cops were also useless. And the ones before them, and the ones before them. I mean, how many cops do you need to die in the same spot for people to get uh, suspicious that maybe it's that spot you should be uh, uh, investigating? Of course, maybe the train knocked their bodies uh, elsewhere, but not one of those police thought to mention in a walkie-talkie there's a secret door in the subway. In the underground. Yes, that's how they're doing this. Not one. But. But. Um. Oh yeah, so. The. Superman hasn't revealed himself yet. And then. When he finally does. It's when Lois is in danger. There's a helicopter malfunction. And it's hanging off the edge of a tall building. You know the works. So. Yes he saves her of course. Um, it, I do have a question. How is he able to. Because he's in a fedora. He's in a, a suit. And he has a bag. And then he goes around. He goes into some. You know those round doors. Uh. He went into a round door, it goes round and round and round, and suddenly he's dressed as Superman. How does this work? How does that work? He goes into a door round and round, and suddenly he's no longer wearing his uh, suit and his bag. What happened to his suit and his bag? But anyway, he's now dressed like this, and he flies and saves her. And then there's a little montage afterwards. He goes around uh, helping people. Um, he helps a plane that's struggling to fly. He helps uh, save a cat uh, from a tree. He uh, stops uh, a robber who is walking on the uh, building with some special shoes and uh, clamps. Uh... Why was he only helping people after the helicopter incident? Why was he not helping people before that incident? Um, I don't know the reason to that. And somehow the police still had no idea about him. They were not believing he existed. Um, 
even though all those people witnessed it and the press were there, I think somehow this one, these police guys did not, had not heard about it. That was odd. Um, oh yes, he has an interview with Lois Lane on some rooftop. Um, how did she know that he was able to see through anything? Like, where did he, she hear that information? Why did she think to ask that question? Because it hadn't been established yet that he could see through anything, so that was odd. And uh, again, he does things dumb, like, why does he tell people his weakness? It's probably not wise to tell the world what his weakness is, that he's not able to see through lead. Um, and how does Superman know how Krypton is spelt anyway? I mean, he knows it's with a K, not a C. Um, well, I think that's what he said. How does he know this? And, uh... They were speaking English on Krypton, so... I don't know... Um... Why they were speaking English. Is English the universal language? Um... And... I'm not sure if he's ever seen Krypton actually written down anywhere because he was getting all of this information from his hologram father. Uh, that's the best way I can explain it. Like a hologram, like his face appears and he speaks. Um, so I doubt he's ever seen Krypton actually written down. And I don't see why it would be important for his father to mention it's with a K, not a C. So, <laughs> again, uh, odd. Um... Thing to include. Um, oh yeah, so it's his job to uphold truth, justice, and the American way. Said the, in the interview, that's what he says. So he was sent to Earth specifically for America. Is that correct, or was it just a coincidence he ended up in America, and therefore he adapted their way of life? He adapted to their ways. What if he had crash landed in Saudi Arabia, or North Korea, or England? Might have been a very different movie. Uh, why don't we find out how fast he can fly, says uh, Because uh, that was one of the questions, and he says, why don't we find out? And uh, this was just clearly a way for him to get close to Lois, to give her a ride around. Yet clearly he didn't go as fast as he could go, and just before that he said he never lies, so wasn't he lying then, straight after he said that? I never lie, and then he says, why don't we find out how fast I can go, without going as fast as you can go, that's very uh, sneaky to me. He only said that about flying so uh, he could give her a nice ride to Lois to pick her up and impress her. That didn't sound very honest to me. Um, Lois says that uh, Clark says, because she doesn't know that Clark is Superman of course. She says that Clark says that Superman is just a figment of someone's imagination like Peter Pan. But first of all, we never saw him say that, and I can't see why he would say that either, since nobody seems to have really disputed that he existed. And if he did want to put forward his doubts, he would surely have done so at the meeting that happened the scene earlier, when the guy wanted everybody to find out everything they could about Superman. The guy, I mean, is the head... The person in charge of the reporters, I don't know what to call him, the uh, manager, the boss, that's the word, the boss. He wanted every, he wanted all the gossip, you know. Surely that would have been the time with, for Clark to uh, speak up, but he didn't say anything about being a figment of your imagination. So it made no sense for Lois to then say that he was like Peter Pan afterwards. That Clark said he was like Peter Pan. Uh, also, in what story was Peter Pan a figment of anybody's imagination exactly? Peter Pan was real in the story, was he not? But whatever. 
Metropolis also has the Statue of Liberty, apparently. This is when they're flying around. In fact, it looked like they had two Statue of Liberty. I'm sure they showed a really tiny version and a really big version. So, it, you know, you know, in Gotham, in Batman Forever, they also had the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> Is everything just based off New York, I wonder? Um, oh yes, why doesn't Lois get cold? It's very odd because they're flying around up above the clouds and she doesn't seem to get cold. Um, all she's wearing is a very thin blue sheet and uh, it's, it looks very, it reminds me of Peter Pan actually, that scene because they're flying like this with their arms you know, the arms are outstretched to the sides. And Lois is o only holding Superman's hand. One of... She's only holding one of his hands. And yet her arms are outstretched. And somehow they're just staying perfectly like this, flat. They're flying like this, completely straight, somehow. Defies physics, for sure. Well, of course a flying person was, but let's just say he... This was real. There's no way Lois wouldn't be would be able to glide perfectly f uh, flat like that. Um, and how does he let he loses her grip for some reason? Uh, he lets go of her hand and she falls through the air for a bit. Seems a bit forced, just to create some tension. I don't see why Superman would lose his grip in that second. Um, the flying scene again takes quite a long time. Like, it goes on too long, also. Then there's a weird voiceover poem by Lois. Um, it was alright, but he was basically saying how, you know, a load of mumbo jumbo. What is this guy? Am I in love? Or something. Uh, again, that poem goes on quite a while. Um, you know, nothing really happened in this movie. Thinking about it, not much actually happened in terms of plot. Um, oh yes, uh, someone said, I don't know, it must have been, uh, either, I think it must have been, uh, Lex who said this, that the planet Krypton exploded in 1948. So the... That means it took three years to get to Earth, I think they said. So, okay, how did Lex figure out so quickly which meteorite has debris from planet Krypton? Because apparently there was a meteorite that fell a while ago. Um, how did he know that it was that what specific one just by ripping a page out of a book? That he already had on his shelf. He already had this book on his shelf. Um, and how did he figure out so quickly that the radioactivity would be lethal to anybody from the planet? I mean, we never see him leave this underground lair. And he's just got a, you know, medium-sized bookshelf, which he's got a ladder being dragged around looking. How is he able to find out this information on that bookshelf? I don't know, it just goes too far, I think, in believability-wise, in terms of uh, this guy just knowing this stuff. It goes, you know, too fast. Um, how does that even work, anyway? Didn't Clark hold a piece of kryptonite earlier when he took uh, to make the fortress? The, the scene was very rushed uh, in that way. It's like they knew they needed to establish his weakness. So just get it out of the way. Very rushed uh, exposition. But uh, it... <laughs> That's right. Uh, meanwhile, you know, after this, Lex is trying to, with his henchmen, trying to sabotage some missiles. Which, uh, there's two missiles, one by the army are escorting and one that the navy are escorting. And, uh, 
they provide some silly distraction and and every armed soldier goes to check on this car accident which they created and they just leave the missile there on its own um they didn't leave one person to guard the missile that they were meant to be protecting um and then the army chief assaults the woman on the ground who was pretending to be passed out or maybe she actually was but I'm pretty sure that was the bad woman. Yeah, that was odd. Like, everyone just forms a circle. All all the men, all of the the army people form a circle around the woman. Uh, and around the woman and the army chief. And we don't see uh, what he does to her. But use your imagination. And why does Luke, why does Luther employ such a doofus? Can he not afford anyone more competent? Some intelligent... Henchman. I mean, he's not a reliable guy. Even he does not trust him. And why does he have him? Uh, it makes no sense. Um, but s- the second attempt, they suddenly have a uh, movable house. All of a sudden. At first I was confused because I thought it was the same missile. I thought that because the first time the doofus made a mistake and I thought that they were going back to rectify it but no apparently it was a different one that was guarded by the navy seals and now they have this movable house from somewhere but again every single navy officer or whatever they were uh, they all go up to them for some reason and then this time the woman climbs over a bridge I uh, don't know how she got there, but she climbs over um, and then she tampers with the missile this time. And, uh, you know, it's very cartoony. It's like a comedy sketch, which is quite jarring. I know things were not very all that serious back then, superhero movies. They weren't trying to be realistic, but up until... You know, everything else seems to be taken very seriously, actually. You know, it's not uh, made out to be a joke, a comedy from beginning to end. They do take it seriously, this film. But except when it comes to the villains. It just seems like a big sketch. You know, they're sneaking around these army guys. All the army guys leave protecting the missile to assault this woman. And then they just sneak. And then the bad guy just sneaks um, up to the missile and fiddles with some dial or something and that's all it takes um, so it it's quite jarring how you know their scenes are always so comical um, how does Lex use some frequency to communicate with Superman only he can hear this frequency how does he know what frequency he hears what is he using to do this? They d- they never show us. What is his range exactly? I mean, if he was in another country, could Superman hear it? Uh, surely Lux would need to be speaking at the frequency needed to hear it. I mean, his voice just sounds like his normal voice. So, I don't know how that works. But then, uh, you know... Uh, Clark is being uh, told to be uh, more manly, basically, by his boss. Told to stand up for himself and stuff like that. Confidence. And then Clark just sneaks out when he hears this message and uh, jumps out the window. And again, he has one of his transformations that I don't understand. How is he able... He jumps out the window and turns into Superman, somehow. Fully dressed as... In his fedora, I think he was wearing his hat, but he definitely had his suit on. He jumps out the window and he transforms into this costume. That does not make sense, even in this world. Um, does not make sense. Where did the costume come from? What happened to the old clothes? It's not like he could have uh, jumped out the window, then mid-flight, went somewhere else, changed clothes, came back to uh, finish the, uh, the the flight down. I mean, it just makes no sense. Uh, unless he's a magician also. 
Um, he looked a bit like Mary Poppins going down into the underground. He like spun, 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 and then he he uh, he spun like this, like Mary Poppins down underground. Um, nobody does any checks. You know, we see the army uh, launching the missiles, and uh, nobody did any checks beforehand, considering how easy it was just to change a few dials to change the tra trajectory of the missiles. That's all it takes. One doofus to uh, mess around with some buttons and the missile goes off an entire different way and there's nothing they can do about it apparently, the army, uh, to uh, stop it. Um, no checks or anything. Uh, and then uh, Somehow Lex got the kryptonite in some box and uh, exposes it to Superman and then he puts it around his neck and then throws him into some water <laughs> in into the pool. Uh, I noticed Superman didn't really try very hard to get away from the kryptonite. He just sort of stood there staring at it. Couldn't he have used his super speed to get away? Couldn't he have just flown away? He didn't even struggle, he didn't even try to get away. Didn't seem like he put that much effort into uh, avoiding it. Lufa just comes up to him and puts it around his neck like a necklace. And uh, it takes him a long time to die. To be honest. He doesn't die, that's the point. He, take, he even gets thrown into a pool and starts drowning and he doesn't die with the kryptonite around his neck. He pleads to uh, the woman for help, and somehow Lex doesn't hear them yelling. Then uh, she uh, sexually assaults him while he is un unconscious. Uh, she kisses him without consent, for sure. Says she did so because she didn't think he would have let her do so later. So it was definitely assault. Bad intentions for you. Lex apparently didn't hear him fly out of the ceiling either because he seemed pretty shocked afterward, later when the missile does not hit. Um, and he has excellent hearing, basically. Uh, he goes around, one of the missiles actually hits and he flies around, putting things back together, trying to save the uh, to from total destruction. But he has very good hearing. He can hear Lois's slight coughs and uh, slight squirms from miles away somehow. And then uh, Superman assaults dead Lois. She dies because uh, the cliff sort of, all of the rocks, there's like an avalanche of rocks. And it uh, traps her in her car which wouldn't start. So battery went dead. So she dies, Superman finds her, assaults her, and then he gets very angry. And then he turns back time. First of all, how did he even know he could turn back time by going round and round and round the earth? Um, I mean, that's quite an assumption to make, isn't it? How did he know that would work? Where did he get that idea from if he was not allowed to... Uh, interfere with human history can't have been his father who told him this then um were there any consequences to this did other people die instead of lois not really sure surely saving people just full stop is interfering with human history regardless of whether they died or not so you know why not reverse time it makes sense doesn't it if you can save people from dying, why not save people from dying? Um, but maybe, maybe if we were to ask his father, maybe saving people from falling helicopters is also against the rules. So, you know, it depends on your school of thought, I suppose, what goes too far. Um, if he can save Lois, surely, how far back can he go? Maybe he can go all the way back to save his father, his adopted father. Why not? Um, 
Yes, exactly. He could have gone back all the way to when his father died, when he was in high school. I uh, guess he didn't care that much, or he didn't think about that. Um, at the end, Lois points out that Clark is never around when Superman is. And then she looks very shocked for a second, but then just shrugs it off the idea, saying it's silly. But that was an odd moment. Again, that was forced, I think, because there's no reason why Clark had to be in that area. They were miles away from the... Um, they were in the middle of nowhere. Lois was there interviewing some Indian... And uh, the photographer was there for, uh, taking photos of the waterfall or something. The dam. Uh, Superman Clark didn't even know where Lois was that day. He had to ask the boss where he was, where she was. So it's not unusual that Clark was not there when Superman was there. There's no reason for Clark to have been there. Um... And I'm not sure what other occasions, again, brought up that idea. What other occasions had there been where Clark should have been there and Superman was there? I can't think of anything in this film. There was that part after Superman flies around the city and then Clark comes in, knocks on her door because they had a date arranged at that time, I guess, but... That's not really suspicious, I don't think. But, well, other than the fact that uh, Superman flew away and the next moment he's knocking on the door as Clark Kent. I mean, that's pushing it, I think, even though he's supposed to be very fast, but still a bit, bit out of there. Especially when we didn't even see him land yet. Um, yeah, she was there interviewing some Native American or something. Uh, he was there taking pictures of the dam. Clark just had his normal day at the office as far as she was concerned. So shouldn't be suspicious at all that Clark uh, wasn't there with her. Um, wow, this has been a long review. Um, one thing to note, a big thing, is that I don't recall any fight scenes at all. And I'm surprised because I remember some criticism against Superman Returns. Apparently he didn't throw one punch or anything. Well, first of all, a punch from him would probably kill you unless he can control it very well. I suppose he could. But there was no action in this at all. Really no action. The bad guys were not scary. They were not frightening. Not intimidating. But they were fun to watch, to be fair. Um, the Fool, you know, he wasn't annoying, actually. I actually quite liked him. Um, Lex was entertaining. The woman was just the woman. Um, but I enjoyed this film overall. But then I did watch it in two halves, so maybe if I watched it beginning to end, it would have been... A bit more of a, of a journey. No, no action. But, you know, it was fun regardless. Um, but, you know, when you think of a superhero, you think of people in the streets fighting thugs, taking people to prison, you know. You expect those scenes, and there wasn't for some, some reason there wasn't. The most we see is him stood like this on a building, looking down on someone else, cl some robber climbing the building. And then he uh, takes him to, uh, I think he does take him to a police station, actually. And then at the end he takes Lex and, uh, he takes Lex and the man to prison. I'm not sure if he takes the woman to prison, I don't remember. But yes, he just flies and then drops him straight in. But I think Lex was actually at large anyway at that point. I think they were after him. Because maybe that's why he was hiding underground at that point. Um, but, you know... The idea, it is... It's 
still quite an original idea that someone's home planet's destroyed and they're sent to Earth and brought up by a human parents. You know, very different origin to Spider-Man, Iron Man, Thor. Even though Thor is from a different planet, but he wasn't brought up on Earth. Captain America, um, you know, the X-Men. It's not, it's uh, sort of brushed over how he has his powers. It's just sort of, oh, on Earth he will have these powers. So they don't go in, into any detail. Just something you have to accept. Uh, soundtrack was great. That's the only part of it that anyone remembers. So, don't remember any other part of the soundtrack, just that. And it always comes up when he's doing something cool. You know, really pumps you up. Great. Acting, of course. Um... I'm going to give a golden moonshin to this guy who plays Clark because his scenes were the best. He, if it didn't have him, this would be a dull movie, I think. Um, he really is the star of this film. Uh, his awkwardness, his, he makes you want to watch him, you know. He's a nice man. He's a polite... Um, and, you know, respectful, and uh, just trying to, uh, he's just fumbling his way around, but he's not, you know, you root for this character, even though it's an act, you think, it, you're rooting for him, and you just want people to respect him as a, as a person too, and no one really seems to except uh, the boss, I guess, but even he is saying you need to be more confident and things like that. Um, but the woman, Lois, is just sort of plain. She looks old, even though she's meant to be young. Even She looks young and old at the same time. But, I don't know. I think that's the point. She's supposed to be plain, but I don't know. She certainly doesn't stand out as a character to me. She's very work-driven. That's all she seems to care about. And that arc doesn't change, you know, she doesn't change at all. No one really changes at all, except, I suppose, Superman, you know, he decides to fly around the Earth. So he's going directly against what his dead father told him in some projection. Don't interfere, and yet he does. So I guess he has something. No, no one else has anything, uh, but the actor did a great job with him. D don't see anyone like him in films anymore, as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't know who I can compare him to in modern day films, as superheroes. I suppose Wonder Woman maybe. Uh, but Wonder Woman is actually Wonder Woman most of the time we see her. Um, when we see her as Diana... You know, the secretary. Is she a secretary in the new film? See, uh, she, she's basically Wonder Woman throughout. Um, so it's not really the same thing. Um, but he definitely has a great charm to him. Uh, Lex was alright, you know. He was fun to watch, I guess. But not scary at all. Um... You, I would give the silver moonshin. He gets the golden moonshin. The silver moonshin will go to... No, I'll give it to Lex. Since he was in it. Uh, you know, I think with someone else it would have been... Doing the same lines I think would have been boring. You know, he has a good sort of... Uh, there's something about him, you know. You like to watch also. And I'm going to give the bronze moonshin to... Uh, the father, not the real father, Carlel, but the uh, the one who has a heart attack because I really enjoyed his scenes at the beginning and I wanted a lot more from him actually. It was a shame uh, when he died so quickly. And an honourable mention to the boss of that reporter, uh, the press, whatever they call Daily Planet, that boss, he... He was a lot of fun to watch also. I was tempted to put him 
uh, second actually. I was tempted uh, to give him the silver moonshin, but he didn't have a whole lot of time um, like Lex did. So I'm giving golden moonshin to Clark, silver moonshin to Lex, bronze to that boss. He wasn't in it a whole lot, but I enjoyed all his scenes. You know, he was... He reminded me of, uh... Jameson from Spider-Man. Basically the same sort of role. He's stern. He's softer than Jameson. You know, he's... The one in Spider-Man, uh, the photography. He's also a press guy, isn't he? He's always yelling at people, shouting, bad mood. This one is more... He's still stern, but he's, he has a more caring side to him. You know, he has sort of a, he, he has a more likability, the, the boss of this press, compared to uh, the boss of the Spider-Man one. He's always looking down on people, um, very uh, angry man. This one, you know, he yells a bit, but uh, he's, he's a good, nice man. Um... So, do tell me your thoughts on this, uh, on this movie. It was cool, some effects, you know, when he was at the end trying to pick up, he was underneath the earth trying to pick up the, uh, earth to stop overflow of magma or whatever it was, trying to fix things. You know, it had some cool moments like that. Um, I liked it for sure. Do tell me how you enjoyed this film. I would be interested to hear your thoughts. And if you've seen it, uh, if you have not seen it, I do recommend it if you're a fan of superhero films. If you're not at all, then don't bother. But it's a great history right here. Um, I just think there should have been some action scene that didn't involve missiles and that kind of destruction, you know. More personal scenes. But thank you for your crimes. I hope you stay with you. This went on for far too long. I will try to condense in future. Wouldn't you? Uh, 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 uh. Uh, uh.